Today's video is full of tips for colored pencil, airbrushing, and even getting white highlights in your colored pencil work. Before we get into the colored pencil work, for those of you who have been following my Red Eye Tree Frog saga, I guess we'll call it, I've got updates for you at the end of today's video. For those of you who are supporters over on Patreon, make sure to head over where I've got over three and a half hours of footage of, for this tutorial available for you now. If you are unfamiliar with Patreon for as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my longer one to two, sometimes three and a half hour long tutorials. I have a new one every single week, and as soon as you sign up, you get instant access to over 200 available right now. If you're not sure if Patreon is going to be a fit for you, you can head over to my Patreon video library where I have a free colored pencil demonstration for you to watch along with my entire library so you can see what is available if you do decide to sign up. The link is in the video description. So to start out with this one, I covered the bee and the flowers where I wanted to keep the white of the paper showing with masking fluid. This is Winsor & Newton. It has a yellow tint so I can easily see where it is. Now, a huge tip if you are using masking fluid, don't leave it sitting on your paper long term. I want that off the paper as soon as possible, ideally within an hour or two. So this is going to keep that paper white so that when I go through with a colored pencil, it will really stick. Now, this way I can airbrush, be super messy, go right over where the bee and the flowers are going to be. I don't have to worry about any of that. I use a stencil, a round stencil, to get that bouquet look, to just create circles, and then I airbrush color over it. So really, really easy to do with the airbrush. You don't have to be skilled with an airbrush to do, you or complete any of the techniques that I'm doing here in this, this demonstration, because I'm keeping everything with airbrush very out of focus. I'm not trying to get a lot of fine, tiny, tiny detail. That I'm going to do with it, the colored pencil. So I'm first airbrushing white, where I'm going to want some of those flowers in the background, just because if I were to jump into the pinks or the yellows, they're really not gonna show up against that blue and purple background. So by putting white in first, that will allow the colors I put on top to stand out better. And really most of what I'm doing here with airbrush, you could just do with colored pencils if you weren't comfortable enough with using an airbrush for something like that. And the entire background on this one, you could do with colored pencil as well, but it would take a really long time. This is a 16 by 20 inch, which is fairly large for what I do anyway with colored pencil. And it's on a Canson Me Tens art board. Now, I've gone ahead and removed the masking fluid. I don't have a recording of that, but I use this little rubber type eraser thing. It's not really an eraser, but I'll put a link to the supplies I'm using in the video description. But this little thing removes the masking fluid. You just dab it on there and it grips it and pulls it off. It makes it so much easier. Now do keep in mind the masking fluid, depending on the type of paper you're using, the graphite lines you're, you're drawing may be removed a bit. It's very, very faint. I can't see a whole lot of lines left over over. Once I remove the masking fluid, that's pretty normal, especially with this type of paper. The longer I leave the masking fluid on, I'm going to run into two problems. One, it's going to remove even more of that graphite. Two, it may try to come out, can bring the paper along with it. It can start to tear the paper because it, it, it sticks too much. So that's why I say you don't want to leave masking fluid on your artwork for very long. That's a, a very quick process. I, I've known of people who will put it on and, and do days and days of worth of work and then pull it off and have problems with that tearing. You can help it to remove a little bit easier by using a hairdryer to apply heat. That will sometimes help it to let go of the paper. But again, you just don't want to leave it on there a really long time. Now the airbrush, the main thing with that, again, I could get the same look just with the colored pencils, but it saved a ton of time. I didn't have to spend more than, I don't remember, maybe an hour or two, working on that airbrush background, which would have taken me probably a week if I just used the pencils. Now the brush strokes that I'm doing, or pencil strokes I should say, here, I'm working the pencil around the edges. I'm using those longer pencil strokes. And then when I'm filling in and layering, I'm working that pencil in little ovals and circles. I wanna keep that pencil pretty sharp. Sharp enough to write with isn't going to get into the little crevices of the tooth of the paper. So by keeping your pencil a bit sharper, that's going to help you to avoid that grainy gritty look. 
That white pencil that I'm using here, this is the Derwent Drawing Chinese White. And I'm putting that anywhere where I want the, the flowers to stay really, really light. It helps me to preserve the white of the paper. Not as good as masking fluid, but it does really help. And I'm using a wax-based pencil there because it's going to work even better if I had used a, let's say, a, an oil-based polychromos for the white areas. That, I'm still going to have some of the color when I blend later with the OMS, would smudge into it more. Here, because I use that wax base, that really heavy wax base, the Derwent Drawing Chinese White, it is not, it's going to stay very, very white in those areas. It really protects that paper well. So there, on that paintbrush, I'm using Odorless Mineral Spirits. This is Mona Lisa Odorless Mineral Spirits. Gamsol works exactly the same. It's supposed to be a little bit less toxic from what I understand. In practice, I can tell no difference, but I'm going over this and you can see how I'm just blending and smoothing out those little pencil strokes and that grainy gritty look there. Now it is normal for your first few layers when you blend with odorless mineral spirits, it is going to look a little bit dull when it dries. Don't worry about that. You're going to put more layers on top. That is totally normal. You do need to make sure that you have multiple layers of colored pencil, whether it be the same layer or other layers overlapping each other, it doesn't matter. You just need a lot of pigment on the paper in order for the odorless mineral spirits to work. One of the biggest mistakes people make when they're using OMS is they just put a little tiny bit of pencil on there. It's it just about what you would do with maybe a watercolor pencil. And they expect it to behave like a watercolor pencil where a little bit of, of pigment would spread like crazy when, once you added water. With colored pencil, that's not how it works. And no, adding water won't, won't work either. You have to use an odorless mineral spirits or a solvent to, to get that effect. But it will, you're gonna build that up in multiple layers to get the color saturation that you want. You do have to have a lot, a lot of pigment on the paper to get those results. Otherwise, there's just nothing for that OMS to work with. Now here, I am using a product from brushandpencil.com. Actually, it's two products. It's Brush and Pencil's Titanium White and their Touch Up Texture. I mix those together and then I'm using a synthetic hog haired liner brush to paint on my little tiny white details that I would never get quite that small or that bright white if I had used a pencil. So you'll occasionally see people use a gel pen or acrylic paint to get white highlights. It's fine if you're just making prints of your artwork, but if you're going to sell it, those products are not going to be archival on top of colored pencil because you're using a water-based product on top of a wax or oil-based pencil. This product is intended for archival purposes with colored pencil. So it is the only one of its kind. I, I know that a lot of people ask if there are alternatives, that this is a little bit harder for them to find. You can't just go into any art supply store and get it. But it is really worth looking into where it would be available for you. And it is available in, in multiple co countries, I believe. Jackson's Art is in the UK. They've got it. Delta Art in Canada. I forget who has it in Australia. But it is something that I, it, it's a must have for me when it comes to colored pencil pencil. The next tip I have for you with this stuff is don't mix a lot. When you mix this, mix the tiniest, tiniest amount. If you mix enough to cover your, you know, everything you're going to need for the whole paper, especially this one being 16 by 20, it's going to dry before you, you are done using it. So mix a smaller amount and when you need more, mix more. Don't think that adding water, like with acrylics, if acrylic starts to dry out, you just add a little bit of water. It'll, it'll, lengthen the lifespan of that bit of, of paint. Not with this. If you add water, it's no longer going to be archival. So just a few tips there for you on using the Touch Up Texture Titanium White Mixture. But look how great these tiny little details were. They show up so well. This product is probably the single product that made the biggest difference for me in working with colored pencil. I was able to get these tiny details that I just always struggled with. Could I get this to look that way or get that effect without it? Sure, but it was going to take me a lot longer and it wasn't so forgiving when I, I decided later on I needed more bright white. This, I can add that at any point without having to pre-plan like I used to in order to, to maintain the white of the paper showing through that you used to have to do versus painting it on top. Now this process was very, very long. Like I said, the, the Patreon video, I've got three and a half hours of footage for this painting, which is abnormally long for, for most of my work. There's a lot of repetitiveness and it's just looking at your reference photo and copying what you see there. When I'm working with flowers, I don't need them to be exact. So that does save some time. I'm not super worried that every little petal is there. It really, to me, does not make a difference to the end result. But I do wanna take my time and pay attention to my lights and my darks, my general shadows. 
this video being sped up as much as it is gives you the illusion that you can get something like this done pretty quickly. No, you can't. This took, I want to say a couple of weeks. It was a long prog project. Maybe it was three weeks. It took a really long time to complete. So don't rush your work. When you've got this much tiny, tiny detail, it really is worth taking that extra time, working slow, and just focusing on one little flower petal at a time. Any of the sped up videos definitely, I think, create a bit of, I don't want to say misinformation because it's not like we're trying to lie to you by saying, look how fast it is. It's just the nature of, of sped up videos for YouTube. But it does, it, it can be challenging for somebody who is new who doesn't realize how much time really went into a piece like this. Some more of that touch-up texture, titanium white mixture. Now, the great thing with that product, I sound like a walking advertisement for them. I'm not. But the great thing about that product is that you can go on top of it with your colored pencil. So let's say I had an area, I needed it to be light, light yellow, but I've already airbrushed that area purple, or I've got colored pencil underneath that's purple. There's no way going straight on top of that with a yellow pencil or even a white and then yellow. It's never really going to come back to where I can get that to yellow. With this, I can paint that product on that area that I might want yellow. Let's say I missed a flower petal. I can paint that over that, let it dry completely, and then go over it with my yellow pencil and it'll stand out just like I, I was up against the white of the paper. I find it to be one of the best, like it's just such a nice thing for fixing mistakes. Or just if I change my mind and want to add something extra. So now moving on to the B, you'll see tons of layers again. I'm blocking in first the general direction of his fur. And I look at him that is very furry, very fluffy. So I'm going to look at that very much like I would fur on any other animal. Now, while I do use my black pencil on a lot of this, I don't want to depend just on black for all of my shadows. And you'll see this a lot later on. Even areas where I am using straight black, I will normally fade into a purple or a magenta before it goes into the yellow. If you blend your black pencil right up against yellows or oranges, it turns into this weird kind of ugly muddy green. Not really the look I'm going for in most cases. So if I can use my purples and magentas instead of black in a lot of these areas, that is going to help me to get more pure, rich colors than that muddy green. And there are times that I love, I'm not one, I know a lot of artists say just don't use black. I love the black pencil and paint, but in this case, it's not always the answer, especially when I'm up against purples, and, or I'm sorry, yellows and oranges. Then I wanna to try to use my purples as much as possible. Again, still just building up that fur texture. And you can see I blended out with the odorless mineral spirit after I got several layers on there, let it dry completely. And that's an important tip for you when you're using odorless mineral spirits, make sure you let that dry completely. If not, you could damage your paper if you work a pencil over an area that's still a bit wet. And once that is dry, I'm going back over this with the Touch Up Texture Titanium White Mixture for my white bright highlights. Now, if you don't have this product, you're going to need to let the white of your paper show through more. You want to try to protect that and just work your pencil around it where you want a little dot or a little line because your white pencils, even the more opaque, the Derwent Drawing Chinese White or the Caran d'Ache Luminance, those opaque pencils still aren't going to be opaque enough to get you this sort of result. So in that case, you would want to work around and let the white of the paper show through as much as possible on an area you need that bright which is why you can see for me, I can be so lazy and sloppy knowing that later on, I'm just gonna come on top with this product. I no longer have to worry about preserving the white of the paper. And some little dots for some of those highlights where the fur, you want it to look like it's aimed at the viewer. That you're just gonna do with dots. Don't feel like when you're painting or drawing fur that you need to make actual lines for everything. Depending on the angle of that fur, some areas that are pointing or aiming at the viewer would just be the, the little dots that you would see. It's easy to make a couple of brush strokes and think, wow, this looks just like fur, it looks awesome. And then you try to repeat that everywhere and now it no longer looks like fur. It looks like weird flat confetti. So you wanna make sure you're getting that variation. Really look at your reference photo. How does that fur move? More of our little dots. When you're using a liner brush like this, biggest tip I have for you is 
to get a thicker line, you're going to push harder on the brush. To get a thinner line, you're barely let, going to let the tip of the bristles touch the paper. So less pressure is going to get you those fine, tiny little lines or dots. And if you're new, if you've been working in colored pencil, you're not typically used to working with a paintbrush, I would recommend get some cheap, like, craft acrylic paint and a liner brush and practice on paper or, or an old canvas, whatever you want to, something smooth ideally, but practice making lines with that first. I wouldn't practice with this product. I think that would get a bit expensive, especially with how it dries so quickly. So I would practice doing your thin white lines with acrylics, not on your colored pencil work, on something else, just to practice getting these brush strokes. And then once you get comfortable with that, then go ahead and use this product because there is a bit of an art to learning to hold and how much pressure to add to this brush to get the desi your, your desired results. Some little hairs I wanna pull out over the background. Now that's one of the challenges that you're gonna run into when you've used masking fluid. It can be very, very harsh where the airbrushing meets the bare paper where the, it was masked off. So I wanna make sure that I'm overlapping those colored pencils into that background, break that up so that you don't have lines or edges that are just too harsh. Otherwise it kinda of looks like you took a sticker and just from something else and stuck it onto a different background. We wanna make sure that when we do mixed media like this, or at least if you're going for the style, you don't want it to really look like mixed media. You want it to all just blend smoothly. So in that case where I've got that harsh edge, I really want to make sure I soften that up by taking some of the fur from the bee and overlapping that into that background. The other thing that I can do is take the background color and lay that into the bee. So let's say I do, my bee would get too fluffy if I overlap the background or the bee fur into the background. I can do the reverse, get a pencil that's the same color as my background and pull some of that into the bee. So I soften up that line. And back to just laying down my base colors here. Lots of purple, it's not just black. I've got some Kaput Mortem where it looks more brown. It's really kind of a, a magenta type brown or a violet brown. I'm gonna blend that out. And see how I pulled some of the pencil right up to the background there. And that is still with the Odorless Mineral Spirits. Now remember when you're using odorless mineral spirits, when you get into future layers, so this is my first time blending this area, I can use more odorless mineral spirits on the brush safely. When you get into future layers, the more layers you have down where you've added your pencil, multiple layers of pencil, then blended, then multiple layers of pencil, then blended, each time you cycle through that process, use less and less odorless mineral spirits. The more pigment you get built up on that paper, if you have too much of the OMS on your brush, you'll get to where you start removing pigment, removing colored pencil, from the paper instead of blending what's there. So I want that brush to be pretty dry when I get onto, or nearly dry, when I get onto those final layers. And again, if you have a problem where you're blending with OMS and you're like, this just made it look more dull, you just, you don't have enough layers on yet. Just keep building and layering until you get that color saturation where you want it to be. And see how the black areas fade into that magenta color before it goes into the yellow. I'm using a lot of the purples from the Derwent Lightfast set. They have the best Lightfast purples of any pencil brand I've used. The Derwent Lightfast, if you don't get any other pencils from them, get their purples. Oh my gosh, they're amazing. The Nightshade and Violet, I believe, those are two absolute must-haves for me. They, they have a richness that other Lightfast purples don't have. The other ones tend to be both from Polychromos and Carintosh. They have purples, but they're almost a grayish purple or they, they just seem somewhat muted. The Derwent Lightfast purples are so vivid, which is fairly unusual for a Lightfast purple. So definitely must have pencils. And I like the entire set. And, and just for transparency, Derwent did provide me with my set to review, but I have gone and purchased additional purples because I go through them pretty quickly. So I did, the ones I, I'm raving about, I did purchase on my own, but they are a really nice pencil. Like the whole brand is, is or the whole series, I guess, whatever we want to call it, of the Derwent Lightfast are amazing.
giving him a whole lot of fluff. Now we want to get just the hint of wings. I want these to be fairly translucent, so I'm not going to cover them completely with colored pencil. I want a lot of that background blue to show through. Then I just go through, work on some tiny little details. That paper under my hand is called Glass Scene. It is archival, it is acid free. It's also what I use in between my work when I store them in a box. I put a piece of this in between each piece. It is just a wonderful product because nothing's gonna stick to it. So let's say I get a little chunk of colored pencil that's kind of floating around. It's not going to stick to that paper and then smudge when I move the paper over. The point of putting this under my hand though is to keep the oils from my hand from touching the artwork. Turns out the oils in our hands, not so archival. So we wanna keep our skin from touching the work as much as possible. And that is what I'm using, doing with that paper under my hand. There is the finished painting. It was a very long project, but it, it's definitely worth it. Sometimes these long projects, they can be a little bit intimidating, but the, all of that added detail, it hides a lot of mistakes. And trust me, there are a lot of mistakes in this one, but there's so much detail, it's not that obvious. So if you are a little bit intimidated by doing something that is this elaborate of a project, just remind yourself that it hides a lot of mistakes. And in the end, I think that the, it is definitely worth the extra effort. I think it's easier to make something that's very busy look good than really simple projects too. So added bonus there. As promised, I've got some updates on the baby red-eye tree frogs. And while most of my footage is going to be this black and white, the night cam, I know they can look a little bit creepy. Just know it's not what they really look like. They look more like this. Super cute, very bright in color, but they are nocturnal. And when the lights are on, they go to sleep pretty quickly. Obviously mine are starting to, I can tell they're feeling better because they don't instantly go to sleep when the light shines on them. Now they're finally doing well after a really big scare a couple of days ago. So last Friday, if you were on the live stream, you heard I was talking about I had to take a fecal sample into the vet again to make sure that everything was good after their flagellates issue, which is, it's a protozoa, so it's sort of like a parasite that they had had when I got them. So we, I had treated them with oral medications saved them. I was so happy. They were doing so good, but I needed to take in another sample to make sure that the flagellates were totally gone. They were, but the vet did find another type of parasite, one that is very common with these guys. So I talked to the vet. We came up with a treatment plan. Luckily, I already had the type of medication that is dosed and meant for frogs. Here, I had ordered it from the UK, so I was all prepared because I didn't know it was a fairly common thing to happen. I wanted to have it on hand in case I, well, I inevitably would need it. So I went ahead, followed the instructions, and again, with the guidance of the vet, followed the instructions in the bottle. They were both to get one drop of this medication on their back, and it was supposed to continue for three days, then you rest a day, and then you treat them again for another, or I'm sorry, you rest nine days, then you treat again for another few days. So that first dose though, overdosed them badly. They were so listless, they wouldn't wake up. When they moved around, it was almost like they were drunk. It was not good at all. I was certain I killed them. So that first night, that was Friday night, I was up all night spraying them with water and trying to make sure they stay hydrated. Skin, or frogs, they don't drink. They absorb everything through their skin. So by misting them continuously, keeping them wet, that is gonna help keep them hydrated and help flush this whole problem from them. So, and also whatever medication might've been left on their skin, wash that off. So I was up all that night watching them and they finally did start moving around right before the sun came up, but that's abnormal for them because these guys do not typically skip meals. As you see them moving around here, they're out hunting, catching crickets. They're all over in there. He's actually gonna head to that bowl right now to eat some more crickets. So I have them spread throughout the tank and then additionally in the bowl so it's easy for them to catch. But they are little piggies. So the fact that they didn't eat, well, the fact that they wouldn't wake up and move was very abnormal for them. So I contacted a friend on Facebook who's in Holland. He's a bit of a red-eye tree frog expert. And he confirmed, he said, yeah, that definitely, that was a, an overdose. It shouldn't have happened with that medication. He's not sure. We're, we're wondering if the medication that it was sent to me, they get it in a, the company, I contacted them, they get it in a large form and then they put it in their own little vials. Uh, and I think that the dropper, the one drop instruction was not for the dropper that was sent. I think it was too big of a drop. 
So the company and the guy, the expert guy from Holland that I spoke with, he they both said dilute that medication, wait nine days. This treatment was probably enough anyway. Make sure they're back to being healthy, eating well, and nine days would be the second treatment. And we'll dilute it 50% distilled water or mineral, uh, spring water and 50% of the medication and then do it the tiniest drop. I'll use a smaller pipette to get a tiny, tiny drop. If they do well, we'll, we'll repeat that the next day and then we'll test and see if they're clear of that parasite. But over the last few days, they've gotten more and more active. Last night was the best I had seen. I didn't have to wake either of them up. They both woke up on their own. They're eating great. But I was so scared that I killed these poor little guys with their medication. Like I was, after everything I'd been through, if that's what, what does on it, oh my gosh, I was so, so scared for them and really mad at myself. I mean, I couldn't have known. I followed the instruction. I'm going by what the vet said, by what the medication says. But still, yeah, I was. I, it was a stressful couple of days there worrying about these little guys. So in other news, one of the bonuses of them spending as much time in their quarantine tank, which is what you're seeing here, it's a fairly boring setup, but it's very sterile, easy for me to keep clean so that we don't keep reinfecting them with parasites. They have a very large planted natural vivarium. It's considered, you would call it a, a bioactive. So they have that that I've been growing out, the you know, plants have gotten established since they haven't been in that tank. And one of the really cool things is recently the isopods, which is a type of little critter that lives in a, in the, the dirt, it eats dead leaves. It will eat the frog feces. When, once they're in there, they, they're basically the janitors. They eat anything left over in the tank like that, and then it, they turn it into fertilizer. And they're pretty cool looking. I think they're cool looking anyway. I'm just going to give you guys a warning. If you don't like bugs, look away. They're not scary looking bugs, but do you close your eyes? I'll let you know when it's safe to, to open them again. But I want to show you how well they're doing in that vivarium. Since the, the frogs haven't been in there to dwindle their numbers, my population is growing really well so that when these guys do make it into their vivarium, their, the cleanup crew will be very well established or the janitor crew, however you want to consider that or call that. So this is a pretty cool thing. Okay, I'm going to show bugs. So look away if you don't like bugs. So these are, can, these are Spanish orange isopods. And those are the biggest in there. I've also got some dwarf white isopods in there, but these are the bigger guys, which are pretty cool. And the frogs will be able to snack on them once they make it into the tank. So added bonus there, but they are really good little cleanup crews. And I think they're kind of cute. They, as kids, I used to play with a, I guess a family relative of theirs. I, we used to call them pill bugs. They are roly polies where they would roll themselves into a little ball. These are in the same family. So completely harmless. Don't worry. They don't get out of the tank and take over your home. They actually wouldn't be able to live in normal dry environments. They prefer the vivarium. So they stay in there. But the population over the last, I've noticed the last week has really seemed to explode. So I've got a lot of them going, growing in there. And I'm pretty excited about that because this tank is going to be so nice and so well established by the time these little baby red-eyed tree frogs are ready to move in. Okay, bug portion of this video is over. You can look again. And as far as the plants go on the update in this tank, these alocasia are probably going to outgrow this tank and I'm going to either have to transplant them somewhere else or divide them. I don't know. We'll see what happens. They're welcome to have this entire half of the, the tank. But those alocasia, the red-eye tree frogs, that's probably going to be one of their favorite places to sleep. That and on the the Phalaenopsis orchid I have hanging up above them. But those big, thick leaves, the tree frogs like to sleep on that sort of thing. So I think they're going to love those. Those are doing well. And then my other favorite plant in the tank is the Addisonii, who is also doing really well. Lots of new leaves on him. He's also got roots that I noticed are growing down through the substrate and into the false bottom. So he's really well established. I'm just, I'm thrilled with how the tank is doing. I couldn't ask for better in here. So that's pretty exciting for me. I don't get out much. These things excite me. With the baby tree frogs, once we get rid of all of these parasites, they should start growing even faster, which means they can move into this much, much nicer house even sooner. So fingers crossed there. Wish them well. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, that should, if YouTube decides to send out notifications, help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week. I would also recommend clicking on that bell notification icon because YouTube is really bad about notifying people lately.